My the a-hole for thinking my girlfriend's relationship with her therapist is inappropriate. My girlfriend and I have been together for three years, and I thought I completely trusted her up until this week. She started therapy three months ago due to her mental health deteriorating. Therapy seems like it's working for her so I've always been supportive of it. I love to see her feel happier every day. She's been more joyful, more positive, and a lot less anxious. She says she's been feeling like herself again lately and her therapist seems to be the reason behind that. I don't know much about her therapist except she found him through a recommendation and her sessions have been online. A couple of days ago, I was using her phone and she got messages from a name I didn't recognize. The messages were pretty innocent, how are you, asking about her work day, if she ate yet. I asked her who it was and she said it was her therapist. I was curious and looked up his name online and found his company's website. I was honestly surprised at his photo. He didn't fit my perception of a therapist, and to be honest he's exactly her type. He looks to be in his early 20s just like my girlfriend and me. Like I said he's certainly her type, I hate to say it but he looks like a more chiseled version of me. Their messages and his photo just left a sour taste in my mouth and I couldn't stop worrying about their communication, so I checked her phone in the middle of the night. There are a lot of messages between them, texts back and forth every single day and I think some are flirty. They use a lot of emojis together, they never send hearts but they'll wish each other good night and good morning with a bunch of happy face emojis, it just seems like they are a little too comfortable with each other. I mean, isn't this guy supposed to keep professional boundaries with his clients? I even saw that they call each other on days she doesn't have a session, one of the calls was almost two hours long. One. Conversation in particular from a few weeks ago was about a concert she went to. She asked him if he was going, and he said maybe, and I assumed he went, as she messaged him later that she got home safe and he said goodnight with a bunch of smiley faces. She goes out a lot but she didn't mention anything about that night. I stopped scrolling after that. This makes me wildly uncomfortable and I don't know how to bring it up with her. I honestly don't know if she even sees this as inappropriate. I've had my own therapist in the past and I would have never communicated with her this way. To be fair she was also a 60-year-old woman who reminded me of my grandma. My head is spinning and I just want the truth. I don't know if it's his texts or his looks that are making me upset, but I'm nervous to bring up my feelings with my girlfriend in case I turn out to be totally wrong and acting crazy. How do I tell her I find her relationship with her therapist inappropriate? My wife and daughter hit her cheating so I abandoned them. I abandoned my family. Wife 36 and me 37 and daughter 13. It's now almost 6 months since that day. I discovered her affair by chance. I was totally clueless. I believed we had a good marriage. Plenty of intimacy, we would talk about stuff for hours, we had date nights regularly. We had shared and individual hobbies. We were healthy, in fairly good shape. It was good? Or maybe it was just me thinking that? My wife, let's call her Eve, she cheated so she obviously preferred another man, not me. And if she could betray me like that she couldn't possibly love me. Here I was thinking she was my best friend, I guess not. In hindsight I can see that I probably saw things through rose tinted glasses. I actually believed that my family cared about me. I believed I was loved. I was a fool I guess. I came home late from work, there was a safety training seminar I had to attend. She was sleeping on the sofa and a message with some emojis popped up on her phone. Emojis like I would use when I message her? What? I snooped and I found out what had been going on for at least 5 months. I knew the AP, let's call him Adam, he was a work college of hers. I had even been to a barbecue at his house and met his family. He was married and had 3 children. The youngest, just 2 years old. While reading the messages something just snapped in my head. It fundamentally changed me. Over the course of reading their messages, I went from loving Eve more than anything, to hating her to just going blank. Not just about her, but everything. Totally numb, I took pictures of the messages and went to bed. I didn't sleep at all, I just stared at the ceiling. Eve was pissed the next day that I went to bed without waking her up. She complained about neck pain from sleeping on the couch all night. I wasn't really listening, I just remember thinking how everything was muffled. As if someone had turned down the volume on the world. I was kind of. Surprised about how little I cared. I felt practically nothing. I should be angry right? During breakfast I didn't say a single word, my wife and daughter chatted away. They didn't seem to notice anything different about me. Or even acknowledge me. But I definitely didn't feel like myself. I felt like I was someone new, someone I didn't know or understand, wearing a suit of the old me. I went through all the daily motions, I went to work, did all the normal stuff. The only difference is I sort of stopped talking. Sadly I realized that nobody seemed to even notice. It's like I wasn't even there. I started to understand that Eve and my daughter didn't really love me. I was in the house with them, but unless they wanted something from me they didn't really interact. They talked at me, not with me, if that makes sense. I would get these pangs of pain, they would come and go. Sometimes they would overwhelm me completely. I was not okay. I walked around like this for 5 days before Eve asked me if something was wrong during dinner, I had maybe uttered 3 words in total to her and my daughter in that period. I didn't even answer her question, I just made a MOK okay slash don't know face then continued eating. She seemed okay with that. The next day I didn't go to work, I worked for the local power company, I fixed power lines and such. I packed up some random stuff plus my camping slash hunting gear. I didn't really have a plan. I put it in my car and walked around the neighborhood for a while. I ended up at the kitchen table waiting for the wife to come home. She came home with a few bags of groceries, she immediately started talking about her day while unpacking. I just sat at the kitchen table in pain. She didn't even look at me apart from one glance as she entered the kitchen. Daughter popped in and did the same. 
their backs were turned to me and they talked about some trivial crap on sale. I have never felt so rejected, unappreciated, so alone. I felt totally invisible, like, I wasn't there, or that I wasn't worth acknowledging. I was thinking back on our lives and all I could see was that they didn't care about me at all. They probably never did, I was an accessory to their life. I just didn't matter to them. I was a convenient and useful prop. I was hit with a wave of pain, I cried, still they didn't notice so I got angry, very angry. I had a glass of water in front of me, I stood up and threw it hard at the tiles over the sink. It just exploded, glass shards rained over everything. They both turned around angry, what the hell? They froze, unsure what to do when they saw my contorted tear-soaked face. It was uncomfortably quiet for a long while before I spoke. Eve, I know all about your cheating with Adam I was surprised how clear it came out since I was clenching my jaw so hard it hurt. My daughter looked at Eve what? Is that true mom? Eve starting to try to explain. She briefly glanced at me and said sorry, I can explain. Then she turned back to our daughter and they started arguing. Again it was like I was invisible or something. Hello? Glass thrower here. After a few minutes watching their increasingly heated argument I just walked out and got in my car, I looked at them again through the window, still arguing in the kitchen. They didn't even notice I had left. I sat there for a few more minutes before I gave up and just drove off. It took maybe 15 minutes before Eve tried to call me, then call after call after call, then a flood of texts from both of them. I just ignored it and eventually turned the phone off. The next day I took half of our money out and called my boss. I told him I didn't know when I would be back. He told me if I didn't show up I would be fired. I just told him okay and hung up. I just didn't care. I went to Adam's house, and his wife opened it. I gave her a copy of the messages and told her what Adam and my wife had been up to. I left her crying on the stairs. At the end of the day I ended. Up in a cheap hotel at the edge of town. The next few days were kind of a blur while I tried to come to terms with things. I didn't make any real progress. Mostly staring at the wall trying to think of reasons not to end myself. Eve's older brother is a cop. Let's call him Bob. Bob showed up on the third or fourth day, I'm not sure. I don't know how he found me. He tried to interrogate me, but I didn't say anything. When I didn't engage, he told me I was under arrest and put me in cuffs. However he didn't take me to the station like I expected. He took me home instead. Bob dragged me into the living room where my wife and daughter immediately started berating me. Still I said nothing. I just listened in amazement while they told me how terrible this was for them. When a terrible a-hole I was making them worry. It went on for a while, in the end Eve screamed at me say something. I stared at her for a while before calmly saying I have nothing to say to you, whore. Bob freaked out, and slammed me against the wall. Screaming at me to not talk to his sister that way. I got a lot of satisfaction out of Bob's violent reaction. I don't know why, it made me so happy I was laughing. Bob's wife left him four months earlier. I smiled at Bob, you're pathetic Bob. Did you beat your wife to Bob? Is that why she left you? Bob hit me hard, I went down. Wife and daughter started screaming their heads off. As I started to get up I just laughed even harder. I just couldn't help myself. I was bleeding from somewhere I saw it on the floor. I am still in handcuffs, laughing. Maybe it was the absurdity of it all? I spat blood in Bob's face and said EFF. You Bob. He hit me again, hard enough to knock me out cold this time. I woke up in the hospital. I puked all over the floor the second I opened my eyes so I knew I had a concussion. Eve, Bob and my daughter were there, they were talking to me, I was too confused to make it out. A nurse appeared and asked them to leave. She got me a pan to puke in and called someone to clean. While she was taking my pulse, I told her that my family put me here and that they were not to come anywhere near me. If they came back into the room I would leave, I would just run away. She argued kind of sternly that running or even getting up was a really bad idea for me. But she would talk to security. I didn't see them again in the hospital, it was bliss. Finally I felt a little at peace, I could think. I was thinking about maybe reporting Bob to get him fired, but it's a small town. His colleagues would probably cover for him. I considered confronting my wife, but that didn't make any sense to me either. I decided to disappear, to turn into a ghost, I wanted nothing to do with these people ever again. I made a letter to each of them, I warned Bob that if he ever bothered me again I would report him. I told my daughter that Eve had betrayed me and that she would be without a father from now on. To Eve I made a longer letter. I tried to be as practical as possible. I told her to sell the house, that I won't be paying the mortgage or utilities anymore etc. I told her reconciliation, or even contact was impossible, especially after she had sent her brother to drag me back and beat me senseless in front of them. I explained that I won't do anything for her ever again, so if she wants a divorce she will have to arrange it. I told her I will disappear and I don't want to be found. If she interferes with my life again I will simply end myself. That we will never speak again. I ended it with how much she had hurt me. I really, really regret giving her that last sentence. It's like I let her steal a little bit more of me, like I let her give me a little more pain. In the hospital I made a plan on how I could disappear, Eve gave the hospital some fresh clothes that they forwarded to me. Then one evening I just went out the rear fire escape. I triggered some kind of alarm I was panicking a bit but, thankfully, no one stopped me. I got back to the hotel to pick up my car. I traded it with a small RV and set off. I got a new phone. The only person I called was my father. I told him everything and told him if he gave my new number to anyone I would become totally unreachable, forever. He could call me if he needed to reach me if I needed to sign something. Other than that I wanted to be left alone. For the first few months I grieved the loss of my old life, but I came to realize that I grieved the loss of a fantasy. A memory that only existed in my head. 
the loving wife and daughter, the family, friends. It was all just an illusion in my head. These people never really cared for me. Caught my wife cheating on me with a bald eagle looking idiot. She thought I was dumb, well look at her now. Me, 44, and my soon to be ex, 39, have been married for 11 years, no kids, we were a pretty chubby couple until 2 years ago when I had a blood test and it came out that I was prone to contracting diabetes and we both bit by bit started to have a very healthy life. We felt great and needless to say I never developed those diseases. We attended a gym almost daily in the afternoon where Baldy worked as a coach. When my wife started getting in shape I noticed most guys turned to see her. I felt so proud of her. Of course Baldy wasn't the exception. I noticed Baldy likes to check out women's butts. When Jane and I were regulars at the gym I noticed she was enjoying the attention she got from men. One day, Baldy took off his t-shirt and started doing crossovers. I turned to Jane with my face of can you believe this guy? But she was staring at him and she wet her lips. I saw Baldy and I swear he was grinning. I felt crushed. When we were driving home, I made a comment about Baldy showing off and Jane said really. I didn't notice I told her you were staring she said I don't remember. I must have been thinking about something else I shrugged it off and kept driving, but from there on I noticed they were talking more frequently at the gym. Some weeks later Jane was doing squats using the Smith machine. Suddenly Baldy went to help her, isn't he nice? He was grabbing her by the waist and I got angry. She finished the first set and I got there and told him in a not so nice way I got it from here. Baldy just smiled and told me no prob buddy, he calls everybody buddy, and walked off. Jane knows me very well and when she heard my angry tone, she said my god babe. I told her we'll discuss this at home. At home, drama blew up. She called me immature and jealous. I told her I noticed he was trying to get into her pants, she said that she knows that. But she would never cheat on me. I then asked why she let him touch her and she said she didn't want to be rude. About an hour later arguing we agreed to change gyms. So we went to another place to do exercise but Jane was resentful at me in the following months, her argument was that I don't trust her. In the third month after we changed gyms, a very good opportunity opened up in my job, but in the afternoon. We discussed it and I took it and we had to attend the gym at different hours. I went in the morning and Jane in the afternoon. This is when it all went south. Jane's resentment increased and we barely spoke. I sent her messages telling her about my day, that I miss her, memes. But she rarely replied or just yes, okay, same here, ha 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 I was very worried and proposed couple therapy. She said I was the one who needs therapy because I'm the one with trust issues. I agreed. I was so desperate to fix our marriage that I even thought it was all my fault. So the following year, 2022, I went to therapy but Jane's behavior didn't change. We weren't intimate anymore, she never was in the mood. I snooped to her phone but didn't find anything out of the ordinary. I looked into her car for a second phone. Nothing. I checked her phone again to see her map history. It only showed me house work house gym house. Whenever I tried to talk to her, she just said she feels that she's having a 40s phase. It'll pass. I never had any evidence of cheating so I continued working and worrying. We live in a condo. The security guard, a very cheerful man called Mr. P, greeted me. He was touching his shoulder and told me yesterday he had to move a heavy sofa and he has some pain today. I was sympathetic and he dropped the bomb. Maybe you can arrange a meeting with your masseuse I told him who? He said the guy who came yesterday to massage Mrs. Jane. It took me a second to process this. I told him do you have a video of him? I think he noticed I was pale and hurried to show. Me. Guess who? Baldy of course, he has come a few times to massage my wife. I took the day off and started investigating. I asked a co-worker for his car and in the afternoon I followed Jane. She parked her car at the mall where the gym is, and there is Baldy waiting for her. They giggle and behave like a couple. Kisses, hugs and I almost start crying right there. They walk a couple of blocks and go into a residential area. I tried to follow them with my phone ready to record, but the guard stopped me and asked can I help you? I just said what a nice couple, do you know them? He said he thinks they are newlyweds, but can't tell me anything else. I called Jane but never answered. I went to her car in the mall and wondered, why that place doesn't show on the map. I dial again and I can hear her phone inside her car. That's why. I also found out Jane hasn't attended the gym in 8 months. I didn't know that the previous night was the last day I slept with Jane in the same bed. I returned the car and went home, and called my parents. Fortunately my dad answered and I told him everything. I was crying and he comforted me and told me to get evidence. Obviously my marriage is over, and I need all I can gather while he'll contact one of his friends who is an excellent divorce lawyer. Jane called me when she saw the two missing calls, I just told her I was already at home and she told me I'm on my way from the gym. My butt is killing me, yeah, I can guess. When she saw me she asked what happened, why did you cry? I don't know how but I was mentally focused, I smiled and told her I got the flu that's why I left work early. Don't come near me, it might be the bug I'll be tested on tomorrow. I'll sleep in the spare room. She agreed. I cried silently and didn't sleep a wink. Nearly midnight I heard her giggling. I guess she's messaging Baldi but I didn't find any evidence of contacting another man. Then it hit me, why didn't I see it earlier? I bet he is. Disguised as one of her female co-workers. In the morning while Jane was in the shower I took her phone. Then I saw it. Under a female name, the profile picture was a dumbbell. I entered and most of the conversations were deleted, I guess they use work words as code in case I snooped, can you deliver the papers to my desk? I know she doesn't have a desk at work. Going to the meeting, where are you? On the top of them boss is in his office. He's clueless, pretty clever. 
I guess I am boss because I know her boss is a woman. Jane got out of the shower and saw me you look worse, why don't stay with your parents? I denied the idea thinking of getting evidence. After Jane went out I contacted my dad and gave me the name and number of the lawyer, I called him and explained everything. He told me the captions I took from my laptop are useless, they don't have any factual evidence since it is not in Baldi's name and she was smart enough to leave pieces of conversation that look pretty innocent. I can take pictures of them at the mall but she can argue they are just good fellas and I can't invade the residential area without permission because it might get me into more trouble. At work I was in zombie mode, thinking how to get evidence. I might install secret cameras in my house but Baldi rarely goes to my home and Jane might find them. Unless. I'm out of the picture. I texted Jane and told her I'm positive of the bug and I'll stay at my parents because I might need help. She liked the idea and told me she would miss me but she'll call me every day. When I hung up, I called my dad and my brother. When I got home she had already packed a suitcase for me. She was so eager to get rid of me. I told her I'll take my laptop and then I checked her messages, boss will be out of the office, wanna come to my desk? She sent this message almost after I told her I was positive about the bug. Good, she bit. We didn't have dinner, no kisses, no hugs. I noticed her. Watching her watch twice. From the door I told her, I'll miss you. I was expecting her to shut the door on my face, but she walked me to my car. And I was gone. My dad and brother were outside the building waiting for Baldi to appear, but he didn't show up. After half an hour I thought why did she walk me to my car? Of course. Because Baldi was already inside the building waiting perhaps inside her car. It would be very suspicious if her massagist came at this hour. I came back, hurried to my house and entered silently. I heard music coming from the bedroom and the moaning. Next to the door there is a sofa, his and her clothes were on it. I put my phone to record and open the bedroom door and there she was, my wife, the love of my life for 11 years and all four and Baldi behind her. I got a very good second of both of their faces when they saw me open the door. Jane screamed and covered herself with a blanket. Baldi went alpha male immediately, walking naked towards me, I took a shot of him doing raw with my wife, he yelled aggressively at me why don't you go for a walk buddy? I hit his throat with my hand open. I saw this movement in the Mel Gibson movie Ransom. The next second Baldi was coughing and gasping, kneeling on the floor. I yelled get out of my house. And kicked him out. I threw his clothes at him when my dad, brother and Mr. P were arriving at my house. I told them I'll take it from here and close the door. Jane was still on the bed covering herself, she was trembling. I told her I have never hurt you nor will I get dressed, I'll wait for you in the living room. While I was waiting I sent the video to my lawyer and he answered I'm sorry for you, but jackpot. A few minutes later Jane showed up, she couldn't see me in the eyes. I started recording the conversation. I asked why? She didn't answer. Was I such an awful husband to you? She started crying but didn't answer. Do you love him? She shakes her head but no. Words. I stood up and hit the table say something Jane. Damn it. She opened her eyes wide and started trembling again, like a puppy when is scared. I have never yelled at her before. I sat and talked calmly. My lawyer will contact you for the divorce. Get a lawyer she finally spoke. We can fix this. Fix what? Our marriage was over since Baldi was on the picture and you chose him over me it was a mistake no it wasn't, it was a choice, you chose and this is the consequence. What did you think would happen when I found out? Silence again. Go to your sisters and tell her the truth or I will show her the video she went to the bedroom and started packing. I followed her and watched. Since two days ago I was trying to convince myself my wife is long gone. The person who I shared my house with is not my wife. But seeing her, putting her clothes inside the suitcase neatly, with her gracious movements and those little things I love of her hit me hard. I went to the spare room and started ugly crying. I heard when she closed the main door. She picked her clothes that were on the sofa. She made the bed where I caught them and I dropped on the floor. So much later I called my dad. He told me Baldi wanted to press charges, but Mr. P told him he didn't sign in, so he's trespassing, the condo can sue him, he dropped it and went out. My nosy brother pressed his ear on the door and my dad took him from the other ear to his car. I was exhausted. The previous days I didn't sleep well. So I almost passed out in the spare room. Next morning my phone had a lot of Jane's messages apologizing and asking for a second chance. I just blocked her. All this happened a week ago. Next week Jane is going to be served. 15 years ago my parents declared me legally dead to steal my money. Now they want to reconcile. This story began over 30 years ago in Germany. I had just turned 16 and was accused of stealing a neighbor's car and wrecking another neighbor's fence with it while running away from the police. I was drunk when the police picked me up, as it was legal to drink in Germany at this age. I proclaimed my innocence but nobody believed me. I was convicted and sentenced to 500 hours of community service because I was unrepentant. My parents used it as a tool to take away my time with my friends, they got the judge to agree that I had to work Friday and Saturday evenings at the THW which was an organization that provided disaster relief and sometimes soup kitchens. Also I lost my license for mopeds and could not get a driver's license till 20. In addition, when I finally wanted to get my license I would have to pass a psychological test. Also I had saved about $5,000 for a car but this was used to pay for damages. Sadly it worked. My friends soon lost interest in me because I was not available to party during the weekend. Also we were very vehicle oriented and I was destined to be a pedestrian for 4 years. An uncle of mine, who led the local THW, conveniently lost my timesheets for my community service work which forced me to work there for 14 months. By the time I finished, I had a bit over 900 hours in community service. When I came out, my parents told me they had asked my uncle to keep me there longer so that I would be forced to learn to take responsibility for my actions. 
They also justified this, saying that they were doing it for my own good and to save me from my friends. However, I finished my hours unrepentant and furious with them for essentially doubling my sentence. When I finished, I was in great shape and did well in school as I lost my friends and had no interest in acquiring new ones after seeing how fickle they were. Focusing on academics was an outlet that was not forced on me by others and I enjoyed it. Then I found out who had actually crashed the car. I told the police and my parents and tried to get my sentence repealed. I tried to have a retrial but failed because my sentence was already served. On top of that, the guy who actually did the deed was sentenced to only 100 hours of community service. At his trial it came out that several people had known it was him, including my parents who made him pay for the damages almost a year ago. They had put the money in a bank account, which they told me I would get, once I had finished my education. They also told me they added what would now be equal to $8,000 to the savings account for the hours I had put in with the THW which was a generous wage for a teenager. Still I was furious with them because I still had to wait until I was 20 to get a driver's license. If they had told me sooner I could have gotten the sentence repealed. Also, while they claimed I would get this money in about 5 years, for now they had essentially stolen my savings. They refused to give it back because I was 17 and too immature to make my own choices. After a huge fight I took my tent and camped out in the woods. I still went to school every day but refused to come back home. After a week they called the cops on me and they took the tent and forced me to go home. However, once the police left, so did I. I slept wherever I could which was mostly barns and in the woods if the weather was good since I now had no tent. On occasion the police found me. My parents called them every day for help. If caught, I would be forced to go home. They'd lock me in a room but I simply waited for school and disappeared after school was out. When I finally turned 18, the police could not force me to go home. I only had half a year left of school so I continued like this. I had no friends because I smelled funny and no interest in getting any friends because I was hurt. I was not going to let anybody close to hurt me again. Despite it all, I managed to finish school with good grades. After school I used the mandatory military service to disappear. I volunteered for service abroad which meant Eastern Europe at the time. After two years, I was done and had a nice nest egg. I enrolled in a university and studied chemistry. I found three good friends and met my first girlfriend to whom I am now married. Everything went well for a while. Then my life spiraled. I was 29 and working on my doctorate when my parents managed to find me. Occasionally they convinced the police to look for me as a missing case. The police usually found me and I'd tell them that I was fine but wanted no contact with my parents and that was it. The police would deliver the message and say that they couldn't tell them where I was and that they should please stop involving the police. Then my parents had a genius idea. They filed paperwork that I had died in an accident in Italy. They were my next of kin so the police gave them my address. Meanwhile my bank account was frozen and the university told me that I was no longer allowed to work on my doctorate while being legally dead. Everything in my life stopped working for me. Two days into this disaster and my parents are in front of my flat demanding to talk to me, telling me that I forced them to take this step. They forced their way inside my home and told me that they were staying until I was willing to talk to them and mend bridges. I told them if they insisted, they could have the flat. I took my laptop, a few mementos, important documents and a bag full of clothes. I left the keys and walked out. It took me a few months to convince the bureaucracy that tales of my death were widely exaggerated. My landlord was very understanding and gave me everything that was left in my flat after my parents understood that I would not be coming back. They mostly took the photos I had left in the flat. They left a letter which I burned. I was really pissed because being dead caused so many troubles. I was afraid they would find me again so I took a job in another city as soon as I finished my doctorate. That was about 15 years ago. They have found me again. This time they sent a relative who told me that they were sorry. That they did mean for me to flip out and abandon my house when they found me back then. They were sorry for letting their emotions get the better of them. They would respect it if I still wanted no contact but they would love to have my wife and I for dinner. Honestly I am not sure what to do. My friends tricked me into breaking up with my soulmate. Now I want to reconnect with him. I have known Bo since we were both 11 years old. We both grew up in a small town, and our families were neighbors, so we became very close friends. We were the next door neighbor best friends that started dating in our junior year of high school. He took me to prom and we both picked a college that was in state with both of our majors available. Everyone expected us to get married when, when we went off to college. Fire. Bo had issues at first making I'm new sorry. friends, but I sort of jived with the gals in class. My new friends Be didn't think much of Bo. Better. They kept telling me I could do better than him. They thought Bo was slow-witted and too religious. They said Bo would just pull me back down to our small town, anchor me with children, and we'd both be stuck as hicks. It reached the boiling point on my 21st birthday. Two of my girlfriends came to me claiming they saw Bo cheating on me. They kept to their stories and I foolishly believed them. I confronted Bo and started screaming at him. Bo didn't apologize, he didn't beg, and he didn't plead. Instead, he got cold and mad. He said that he never trusted my friends, that they were playing me, and he thought I was better than this. I didn't believe him and I let him walk away. He promised that if I took their word without even looking at them critically, we were over. And he kept his word. From that day, he wouldn't even look at me. He wouldn't talk to me, he wouldn't acknowledge I existed. For the rest of college, he never dated anyone. He just worked, went to class, and graduated early. My friend set me up on a ton of dates. I had a bit of a wild college ride, something I'm a bit ashamed of now. Once I graduated, I tried to get established in life, but my college friends kept just wanting to hang out, chill, 
or party. It honestly got tiring, and I couldn't believe I had the energy to do this for nearly four years while getting an education. It was when I was 23 that one of the girls called me a stick in the mud and said something along the lines of I can't believe we went through the effort of breaking you up with Bo if you were just going to become a wallflower. I couldn't believe it. She went into detail about how easy it was and I felt disgusted. I didn't give Bo another thought after the breakup. I thought he was a cheater, and I told my family, who told his family and it strained his relationship with his mom for many years. But after that point, I couldn't stop thinking about him. I told my family the truth about what happened with Bo. This apparently helped repair the relationship Bo had with his mother. Bo's mom liked me quite a bit and she went out of her way to sabotage Bo's relationships with any girl he brought home. My mom said Bo's mom did it very discreetly, but after finding out the truth, Bo's mom came clean and Bo nearly cut her out of his life. She apparently begged and pleaded, and was able to work from there. I have many unfinished drafts of emails to Bo, some saying I wish to catch up, others begging for forgiveness and pleading for him to come back to me. But any news I got on Bo after the blow up with his mom has been sparse. Bo doesn't do social media, and I had no idea where he lived. I found out recently that Bo has been married for three years, and has a two-year-old son. He has moved back to our hometown and I saw him at the grocery store when I went to visit my parents two weeks ago. He didn't see me, or at least I think he didn't. But, there he was with his wife and child and I instantly felt a swirl of emotions. Jealousy, rage, regret, depression. Even now seeing him with his full family, I still want to beg him for a chance, which makes me feel awful. But at the same time, I feel like I should at least say my piece. I talked to my mom about it, and all she said was the chickens come home to roost. Don't make trouble for Bo. I just know that if I can't talk to Bo one last time, I will regret it for the rest of my life. So I emailed Bo last night. Hi Bo, it's me, Amy. I know it's been years since we talked, and I wanted to apologize for how we broke up. I also want to apologize for how it spread back to our families. I know now that Tracy and Stephanie were hell-bent on breaking us up any way they could, and I can't begin to apologize for the hurt it has caused you. I'll be back in town in a few weeks and was wondering if we could have a coffee and catch up. I want to know what's been going on with you and your life. This morning I got a reply from Bo. Amy, I want you to know that I have forgiven you years ago. I hope you are doing well, but I would have to say no to coffee or catching up. My wife and I have a strict rule that neither of us hang out with exes. I hope you understand. I tried emailing him to say he could for sure bring his wife with him, but he's not replied since. Can I, I guess my mom was now? right, there was no chance Can to reconnect. From File a false restraining order and threaten to unalive me? Okay, let's dance. A few years ago, my now ex-wife filed a false restraining order against me. She was living with her boyfriend, we were getting a divorce, in another state at the time, and I decided that a false restraining order was an excellent way to be awarded full time. possession of the vehicle I had purchased. We only had one key to the vehicle, and she was in possession of both the key and the vehicle. It was her wish. This is important later. And I was exceedingly upset was that she had knowingly filed a false restraining order, and upon being served, I immediately submitted my appeal and request for a hearing. I contacted my company, and had them print off all my Department of Transportation GPS logs, as well as company internal vehicle tracker data. I also printed out my personal GPS tracking data from the navigation system I was using. So not only did I have federally accredited logs showing exactly where I was, or more importantly, was not. I also had two very detailed systems information showing my exact speed, cardinal direction, and other pertinent information. Recorded in 2 minute, and 30 seconds intervals. After I had compiled my entire body of evidence, I wrote a three-page testimony to read to the court slash judge to assist in explaining the entirety of the data, as well as present my side of the appeal. Almost 30 days passes, and I realize that upon adjournment of the case, and subsequent exiting of the courthouse, there is a chance I will be able to reach my vehicle before my ex does. With this in mind, I decided to contact the dealership from which I had purchased the vehicle, and acquired a second key. As we had only received one key when we purchased the vehicle, I knew she would not expect me to even be capable of driving away in it. So, fast forward a few days to the court date. I had driven across two states to attend this court judgment appeal, with all my paperwork, written testimony, and key to the vehicle. I arrive approximately four hours prior to the hearing time, and patiently wait for the magic moment to come. Bad news. It was extremely anticlimactic. As she was a no-show. The judge summarily ruled in my favor, and the restraining order was dismissed. The judge then asked if I had anything further for the court, and if not, I was free to go. So I very politely asked me, Your Honor, it is my understanding that the restraining order slash Poe is lifted? Judge, yes ma'am. Me, so am I, at this time, able to retrieve my vehicle? Judge, ma'am, as the judge of this courtroom, I am unable to provide you with any form of legal advice. Me, oh, okay, I'm sore judge, however, if you find a seat in the back of my courtroom, my, secretary? Court recorder? I don't remember the term, we'll provide you with a signed order of dismissal for the restraining order slash pub. If you were to be questioned by law enforcement for any reason regarding property or contact, it is best to have this documentation on your person as the cancellation of the order may not reach the police system until close of business today. The way in which the judge had worded her response was very clear and intent. 
she could not specifically tell me I was good to retrieve my vehicle, but she was taking the extra time to provide me with the paperwork that gave me a legal opportunity to retrieve my vehicle. So I sat down, and after nearly 10 minutes, the court official that was designated with the task of typing and printing the paperwork, got the judge's signature on it, and brought it to me. As I put it in my binder of other paperwork, and turned to leave the courtroom, the judge called out to me. Judge, Mrs. BTK 216. Me, turning in mild surprise, yes, your honor? Judge, with a devious smile, good luck. Now I had to formulate a plan. See, as the ex-wife had not been present for the court proceedings, neither was my vehicle. I had the address for her boyfriend slash boyfriend's parents' house. Going? As it was all, over the initial what? restraining orders list of protected properties. And she had accidentally left a notebook with it written upon it when she first left to be with the guy. I decided to utilize Uber to go to the address, and check if the vehicle was present at the address. Upon starting the Uber trip, I requested the Uber driver to wait for me at the address after dropping me off, giving her a quick summary of my circumstances and plan, to ensure that I had a witness present for the intended retrieval of my vehicle. Quite simply, to ensure that no false allegations of fictitious activities during the recovery of said vehicle would have a metaphorical leg to stand upon in court. The lady Uber driver was sympathetic to my cause, and agreed, even going so far as to give me her personal contact information in the event I required her for a future court appearance. Upon arrival at the address I had available, the vehicle was, indeed, present. The Uber lady waited until I had acquired the vehicle, left the premises, and she followed me about two miles to witness I had left the property completely, and then she went on her way. Bless that lady, she was a saint, so, I make it about a half hour away, and my phone rings. I answered it, and it was my ex-wife's boyfriend, and as you can imagine, he was not happy. He rambled off several vulgarities, and other random insulting comments which I entirely brushed off. Then he made a very large, and unintelligent mistake. He said if I ever see you again, here, or anywhere, I will blow your head off. Now, I'm a veteran. I don't take very kindly on threats to my life. I was upset at him, I was upset at her, and I was just handed a gift-wrapped means of complete and utter destructive revenge. I immediately hung up with him, and dialed 911 to report a verbal threat on my life. I headed to the parking lot of a local big box store to meet the responding officer, and ensure I didn't leave until I had a case number, attached, written statement, and the reporting officer's identification information. I completed my trip to my home state, and the following Monday, this was all on a Friday, I went to my local courthouse and filed for an emergency restraining order slash po. The judge that was available to hear my case for an emergency order was, interestingly enough, the same judge handling the divorce. She listened to the case I provided, reviewed the police report information I provided, and issued the requested emergency order. Doesn't sound like a pro revenge, does it? Well, my ex-wife was living with the guy in his parents' basement. The restraining order slash po issued by the judge protected myself, my property, and my spouse from him. See, we were still legally married, so I was legally able to list her as protected party. When the restraining order was served, he couldn't be within 600 feet of my, now, ex-wife. As she lived with him in his parents' basement, he wasn't the one that had to leave, she was. But, she no longer had my vehicle. She lost her brand new job. She wasn't able to get to school, so she failed her college course, but was stuck with the student loans for it anyway. She was now homeless, vehicle-less, jobless, kicked out of college for non-attendance, penniless, as she is atrociously bad with finances, and, to top it all off, she was nearly four months pregnant with his kid. Moral of the story? Don't piss off a lesbian veteran. I don't like to play play games. I will go out of my way to avoid playing games. I will bend over backwards to make sure I don't have to play games. But if you force my hand into playing aforementioned games, I will not be the one that loses the game. Which, is something I told her verbatim on our third or fourth day. Guess she forgot. And leave me for a deadbeat? Karma will find you with a little help from me. My ex-wife and I got divorced two years ago. A miserable part of my life I'd love to forget, but something recently happened to trigger my breaking point. We have two wonderful children together, now 11 and 13. I must admit the divorce was incredibly difficult on them both to the point now I see how much damage was done. Overall though they've been strong throughout, leaning on each other for support. In the divorce, my ex-wife got the house and close to full custody of our children. The best I could get was every other weekend. My apartment is an hour away and has only one bedroom. The home prices are very high in my area, and I cannot afford much else. So, the kids live with her daily and get to stay at their home schools. This hurts, but I don't blame the courts. I'll admit it made sense. They wanted the kids to stay in their homes. While I miss them very much, I focused on my work. I'm looking to get a promotion so that maybe one day I could move into something a little better and live closer to the kids to be in their lives daily. Six months ago she got this new boyfriend. And within three months this guy moved into my home, under the same roof as my children. Of course, I soon hear through the grapevine how everyone is swooning over this man and how fun he is. Including my children. My ex-wife and this man are taking vacations together with my children. One to Disney World and one to San Diego early this summer. And who is paying for most of it? Me. She only works part-time, he is a deadbeat. My guess is it must be some of the money I send them every month. While this had me boiling, I tried my best to hold my feelings inside. That is until last weekend when the kids came to see me. My favorite part of the week. When they arrived, they could talk about one thing, the vacations. And how much fun they have been having with mom and her boyfriend. They showed me all their new clothes along with brand new electronics as well. 
Both new iPads and AirPods. All were bought by the new boyfriend. At this statement, I lost it. Two years of pent-up rage exploded. You see my children had no idea why their mother and I got divorced. No clue that she cheated on me over six months with not one, but three other guys that I know of. She dropped the kids off at her mother's while I was away on business and sleep with these guys. Usually renting cheap hotel rooms to sleep around like some teenagers. Eventually, she settled into a regular affair with one guy. This loser lived in his aunt's basement at the time. You have no idea how bad that part hurt. I found out one day that something was up. I was doing the laundry when I found a hotel key in her pocket along with a receipt. This confirmed many of the suspicions I'd been having. But this is my first piece of evidence. Still, I did not want to believe something was going on. So, I faked an overnight trip and watched her. Well, it did not take long for the kids to get dropped off at her mother's house followed by bringing someone into my own house. A man, carrying a six-pack of something. I did not confront her that night. Instead, I went to the bar and drowned myself in alcohol, spending the rest of the night crying in my car. It was late the next day when I confronted her, secretly hoping she would feel bad or tell me it all was a mistake, but that did not happen. She blamed it all on me. I'm not around enough. I'm too strict with the kids. Not fun like I used to be. You name it, she had an excuse as to why she was justified in her actions. Right there she said she wanted a divorce. I cannot describe how much these words hurt. They hurt like a knife in the gut, almost worse than the cheating. As the divorce was worked out, we decided to keep things light with the kids. Her therapist suggested this. So, in the end, we told the mom and dad just needed to be apart. It was not their fault at all, and we both still love them. Well obviously, no matter how light you make it the kids were devastated. They were hurt beyond anything I could have predicted. But it happened and we all lived with it. Last weekend when they showed off all their new toys and gushed about all the vacations, I lost it. I looked both in the eye and asked if they wanted to know the real reason why your mother and I divorced. This is where I think I took things too far, but I couldn't help it. I said something along the lines of kids, your mother slept with three other guys. One in my bed. She is a liar and a cheat and drops you off at her grandma's house so she can act like a spoiled 18 year old again. Her boyfriend, the one who brought you all this stuff, is unemployed, and the one she was with while married to me. I then proceeded to pick up the phone and call her mother. Of course, she picked right up. I gleefully explained the whole story to her mother, whom we also hid the reason for our divorce from. The place she'd drop off the kids to get me time as she called it. Always lying to her about the many reasons she needed a babysitter. Well, let's just say her mother was not pleased by her daughter's actions. Now my ex-wife is in a heap of trouble. Her mother is furious with her. The kids are devastated. They are now old enough to see it was her fault after all. Well, I've received multiple calls from her. All unanswered. She is begging to talk. She wants me to take it all back. Explain it was some lie I made up. Tell the kids it wasn't her fault after all. She says they are not talking to her now and treating her differently. In a way, I do feel a little bad for my actions. She is a good mother and great with our kids. But I just could not hold it in anymore. My stepdaughter has been taking photos of me while I sleep. The reason was worse than I could have imagined. I don't know what to do. I'm really freaking out right now. Apparently, my stepdaughter has been taking photos of me while I sleep. I could really use some help. Six months ago, I married my husband, Harry. Harry has a daughter from a previous marriage named Lily. I don't have kids. Lily and I have never gotten along. However, in the past few months things have gotten much worse. She used to just ignore me. Now, she's actively aggressive. I found paint on my favorite heels. She accidentally used one of my favorite t-shirts as a cleaning rag. She even spilled some sort of black ink in our bed during an art project or something like that, who knows. Harry has talked to her. Over and over again. But he hasn't really disciplined her. I keep telling him she needs to see the consequences of her actions, but he's too much of a softy to actually ground her, or take away her phone. He keeps telling me she's going through a tough time. Please, just let her be for a few months. I tried to ignore it. But then it got worse. Harry was on a three-day business trip, so I was completely in charge of Lily. And she amped it up to 11. The very first morning, she came down the stairs wearing one of my necklaces. You can wear my jewelry, but need to ask me for permission first, I told her. I don't need to ask permission for anything, she replied, rolling her eyes. Yes, you do. For the next three days, your dad's gone, so you need to listen to me. No, I don't. You're not my mom, she shouted. Classic. Then she pulled at the necklace and snapped it right in two. I wanted to scream. But instead, I calmly confiscated her phone. Harry would be furious with me. But I'd had enough. When she got home from school, she ran into her room and locked the door, crying. I explained everything to Harry over the phone. I could hear the annoyance in his voice, but he agreed that she needed to learn, and it was okay to keep her phone for a few days. So I thought things were looking up. Then it happened. Later that night, after Lily went to bed, I wanted to take a picture of our cat. But I grabbed Lily's phone by mistake. And after I took the photo, I went to the camera reel. I found a photo of myself. Sleeping. What? The? Heck? It was a dark, grainy photo. She hadn't used the flash. 
but I could still make out my face, you clearly, smushed against the pillow. Eyes closed. I could make out Harry's silhouette in the background behind me, facing the Are other way, serious? and my book on the nightstand. Before I, I could stop myself, I flipped to the next photo. And there was another myself. one. Another one of me sleeping. How taken from a me? different angle. We taken from below. Alive. Like she'd been hiding under the bed. My thumb raced across the screen as I flipped back through the photos. There were dozens of them. Dozens of photos of me sleeping. One taken from inside our bathroom. You another taken from inside our closet. Ready. I looked at the timestamp on them and they were all taken around 2 a.m. Over the course of weeks, I tried to call Harry. Three times. But his phone went right to voicemail. It was after midnight, and he had an early meeting tomorrow. He must have turned it off. Come on, come on I muttered, calling him a fourth time. Jen? I jumped about a foot in the air. Lily was standing behind me. In the semi-darkness. Her wavy hair hung halfway over her face. I backed away. What do you want? I asked, quickly ending the call. I want my phone back. Not tonight, I replied, my heart pounding. Maybe tomorrow. She shrugged. Okay. Then she went back upstairs and into her room. I flipped through the photos one more time. Why in the world would she take these photos? To intimidate me? To scare me? To help her plan of murdering me? There was a much more likely, much less sinister reason. She could have taken them to embarrass me. Maybe she planned to post them all over TikTok or Instagram. Me, sleeping with my mouth open, looking like a pile of dung. Really mean of her. But not psychopathic. Still, I locked my door that night anyway. After talking to Harry, I felt better. He thought the same thing. She was taking them to post them online or something, but he was now in total agreement with me. This has gotten out of hand. I'm gonna talk to her as soon as I get back. So that was a relief, at least. When I picked her up from school Lily asked, can I have my phone back today? If you're really nice, I'll give it back. Okay. Like I said, I just locked the bedroom door at night. She couldn't take more photos of me. Later that night, I regretted my promise. Lily was a perfect kid. She thanked me for dinner. She washed her dishes. She even folded the towels sitting on the dryer. And while I didn't want to give the phone back, I wanted to reward her for being so good. So I gave it back. At 2.30 a.m. I woke up with a start. As I sat up in the darkness, I realized what woke me up. A clicking, metallic noise. It was coming from the door. The door creaked open. And there was Lily, with a bobby pin in her hands. She picked the lock. What are you doing? I hissed. Her eyes went wide. Then she ran back down the hallway, towards her room. I jumped out of bed, running after her. Hey. Hey, I shouted. Why are you taking pictures of me? She stopped. Then, slowly, she turned around. Dad didn't believe me. So I had to take the pictures. Didn't believe you? About what? She didn't say anything. Instead, she handed me her phone. She swiped to the first photo of me, taken in the darkness. Grainy and dark. She pointed to the window. Look. At what? Turn the brightness up. I did. And then I gasped. She flipped to the next photo. And the next. My heart began to pound. In the window behind the bed you could see a figure standing there peering in. It looked like a man or a tall kid but I couldn't tell who it was. The phone fell out of my hands. Dad didn't believe me. When I showed him the pictures, he didn't see it. He yelled at me and said I was reading too many scary stories. So I've been showing them to my friends. Lily and I are staying at a friend's place for the time being. We're not going back there. Not until we talk to Harry, not until we figure this out. When he gets back he's installing security cameras. Hopefully it's just some pervy neighborhood boys peering in because I don't wear a lot of anything when I sleep. A seemingly normal day took a horrible turn for the worst. When I was 19, my mom was threatening divorce, and my dad was very, very depressed over it. For about a week I went back and forth from the place my mom was staying in my home, where my dad was. I tried to make him feel better, but he kept asking me about my mom. He'd ask me to talk to her and do anything I could to change her mind. I felt bad for him. He loved her and hadn't done anything wrong in the relationship but according to my mom she had fallen out of love with him. I couldn't bring myself to tell him my mom had already made her decision. The night before Father's Day, I was leaving to spend the night with some friends. Before I left, I told him I'll be back early so I could make breakfast for him for Father's Day. He said he'll take a rain check. I didn't think anything of it. I went to a club that night, and took some substance we'll call E. I was at the time also prescribed Addy and was discreetly taking more than recommended. After an hour of feeling nothing, I began to feel lightheaded and hot. My heart started racing and I could barely think. I begged my friends to take me to the hospital and told them that something was happening to me. They shrugged it off. Finally, a boy I met that day who was friends with one of my friends drove me back to his house. The whole ride home I was struggling to regulate my breath and heart rate, fearing for my life. When we got to his house, my body began to calm down, leaving me extremely weak and exhausted. I remember laying on his bed, still terrified of what and still could happen. 
His dog came up to me, jumped on the couch. He curled up next to me, making it so his head propped on my leg, a melancholy look on his face. At about 6 a.m., all my friends were home. After they begged for forgiveness for not caring for me like they should have, I asked to be driven home. On the way, I randomly started tearing up. I was thinking I'd have to ask my dad to take me to the hospital, something still didn't feel right. My anxiety had skyrocketed and I needed to get to my dad. When we got to the house I went to the door to see a note taped onto it. It basically said, don't go in the house and call the police. I'm sorry for being such a coward. My already weakened heart dropped. In shock, I called the police. With my eyes completely dry, I told them that my dad had unalived himself. I sat on the porch and cried. There was a lot of crying that day. My mom wailed when she drove up to the house, crying oh my god, oh my god. I was taken to our neighbor's house and put to bed in the guest room. The rest of the day was spent alone, willing my body to survive. There were moments where I felt like it was going to shut down. I was too weak to cry. After a while I realized it was Father's Day. It's the most dangerous sneaky link experience. I was going into my senior year of high school. I had been going to underground rap shows and house parties for the whole summer. I kept seeing this one stunningly beautiful white girl from across the room nearly every time I went. That told me two things. She was into the same scene and the same music I was into, and she was down for the brown because she was in the middle of North Philly partying with the city kids when I could tell she was clearly a county girl. One night I worked up enough courage to go over and talk to her. My friend had given me lessons and advice on how to secure the W. I implemented the tactics and after that night we started Snapchatting every day. One of those days, about a few weeks later, she sends me a text telling me that she's home alone and that her parents have left to go see a movie with her brother. Coincidentally, I was in the area hanging out with some friends that went to my high school which was out that way. I stopped the conversation going on with my friends and begged my guy James to take me to her house at that very moment. I had to give him $10 for gas but he took me. 20 minutes later we were outside of her house. She had stopped texting me after she sent the address so I let her know we were outside. We sat there for about 5 minutes before James told me to get out so he could go back to our friend's house. I understood so I let him go and made my way to the front door. Just as I was about to ring the doorbell I heard her call my name from around the side of the house. She waved me over and pulled me in through the back door. I asked her why the back door if no one is home and she told me it was because the front door lock is broken. The door is stuck closed and she has nosy neighbors so she didn't want them to get suspicious and tell her parents that there was a guy that came in through the front door. I wanted to tell her that we had been sitting in front of the house for a while anyway but I didn't want to worry her and kill the vibe. Things escalate as soon as we get in the door. She pulled me onto the couch and the next thing I knew, I was shirtless. She paused for a second, took me by the hand, and led me upstairs to her bedroom. Everything was pink. The curtains, the bed sheets, the bed frame, the walls. Everything. It was odd, but I wasn't worried about it at the moment. The next moment I was in my underwear in her bed. The second my pants hit the ground, there was a commotion at the door. She swung to an upright position like she was possessed and shushed me. Downstairs I can hear what I presume to be her family. She sprang out of bed and rushed to throw her clothes on. She put the sheets over my clothes. I could hear footsteps coming up the stairs. She shoved me in the closet and put her finger over her lips to tell me to be quiet. She did not have to tell me anything. I was barely going to breathe in that closet let alone make a discernible noise. Two seconds later, her dad was in the doorframe. They greeted each other and she said, I thought you guys were going to the movies? He said, we were, and then we got a call from the neighbors saying there was a car they didn't recognize that pulled up to the front of the house for a while, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, I've just been in here all day, I didn't see a car. He nodded his head and waddled into the room and checked around a little bit. He walked toward the closet and got about one foot away from my face before he turned around and walked toward the door. He told her they were just going to watch a movie downstairs instead now and told her she was welcome to join. She said, yeah, sure and left me in the room. After they left I breathed a sigh of relief. As quietly and as fast as I could I gathered up my stuff and threw my clothes on. I was clipping my belt when I realized I had left my shirt downstairs by the couch. Oh nah. It wasn't the end because I would have to go downstairs to get out anyway, and she had like three different living rooms. The one where my shirt was wasn't visible from the one with the big TV in it. The only problem was that I would have to complete the mission shirtless. The original fallback plan I had thought out in my head was to pretend that I was her gay best friend. There would be no way to talk myself out of it if I was caught half naked. I gathered myself, took a deep breath and walked toward the door. I cracked it a little bit to see if anyone was in the immediate vicinity. The coast was clear. So I crept out into the upstairs hallway. I closed the door slowly and carefully behind me. When I turned around I froze dead in my tracks. Out of the corner of my eye I could see someone in the room across from her sitting upright. My heart was beating out of my chest. I slowly turned my head. It was her brother. He was playing video games with headphones on. Completely oblivious to my presence. Thank God. I moved slowly toward the staircase, and gently down the stairs like a mouse. The Mission Impossible theme song was on loop in my head. I got to the bottom stairs. I could hear the family talking but I couldn't see them. The one right side of the staircase was invisible to them, so I stayed low and crept down that side staying tight to the railing. I got into the living room that was connected to the kitchen. That's where my shirt was. All of a sudden the mom calls for the son to come downstairs. I can hear his dragging footsteps coming down. I ducked behind the sofa so that I wouldn't be seen if he came the same way I did. The only problem was that I could not see him. At that moment the mom walked into the kitchen to microwave popcorn. 
My stomach was churning while I heard the popping noises. I think the sound of popcorn popping will always induce anxiety for me now. I could hear her grabbing a bowl from the cabinet. I heard her walk away, so I slowly stood up from behind the couch. As I stand up I'm met with a face six inches from mine. It's her brother. The little weirdo just stood there the whole time and didn't move. I had my shirt in my hand at this point. He walks away to the TV. We did not exchange words. There was somewhat of a mutual understanding between us at that moment. Seconds later, the whole family comes out of the living room while I have my shirt over my head with my arms through it. It was barely on, but I figured it was good enough. I threw my hips to the side, let my left wrist go limp, and gave the zestiest hay I could possibly muster. The mom broke out into a scream. The dad bolted upstairs. This was my cue to get out of there. I darted for the front door and tried the handle. I had forgotten she said it didn't work earlier. Oh no. The dad's heavy footsteps slammed down the stairs behind. I took off toward the back door. I heard a shotgun cock behind me. I prayed this door would just open easily. It did. I flung it open so hard that I thought I had been shot. I ran for what had to be two miles in the first direction I saw before I stopped to make the phone call to my friend to pick me up. Who is the most unexpected person you ended up dating? I went on a date with a guy who tried to rob me. Two years ago, I returned home from my father's funeral. As soon as I opened the door to my apartment, a guy holding a crowbar came out from my kitchen holding my TV. I live in the city, so robberies are common. The guy began shouting at me and he clumsily dropped my TV and began holding the crowbar like it was a baseball bat. I was so stunned at what was happening that I didn't move. The guy screamed at me to empty my pockets. From the stress of the last few days with my father passing away, I simply started crying. Not out of fear at what was happening, but because this was literally the worst time of my life. The worst moment. The worst minute and second. While crying hysterically, I gave the guy my wallet. I just sat on my floor and hugged my knees and told him, through my tears, to, take whatever you want. He hesitated, looked down at me. He dropped my wallet and sat down beside me. Immediately, he began to comfort me. He began to apologize. He put my TV back on the table and told me it wasn't damaged. He told me that he lost his job and that his mom needed medicine that he couldn't afford and that they were homeless. He told me all of this while I just wailed. I cried for my father, who was lost, I cried for my future, for it was uncertain, and I cried because my home had been intruded on in the most violent way. For a good 10 minutes I sat on the floor with a guy who had every intent to rob me, telling me that it would be okay and that he was sorry. He begged me not to call the police. I just started screaming at him to get out. He ran away so fast that he left the crowbar. I threw it after him as he ran down the street. Two days later, I came home from work and he was sitting in front of my door. I was so terrified that I pulled out my phone, but he had this look on his face of remorse and regret. He told me that he told his mom what he did, and his mom made me some soup. He handed me this tiny bowl wrapped in tin foil. Again, I was so stunned and overwhelmed and angry that I slapped the bowl out of his hands and it shattered on the floor. I told him to leave or I was calling the police. He left. I remember he looked upset. I left the soup and shattered bowl outside my door, almost as a warning for him to not come back. About three months after that, I got a note in my mail slot from the guy. He told me his mother had passed away and that he was no longer homeless and that he had a job. He wanted to repay me for breaking into my apartment. He wrote down his address and told me that I was welcome to break into his place if I wanted, but he didn't have much stuff. This all overwhelmed me. I threw away the letter, but I remembered his address. I remember walking by there one day, out of curiosity. It was a ratty apartment building across the city. He was walking up to his room and he saw me. He waved. I turned away and left. He ran after me and apologized again. Told me that he never meant to do what he did. He showed me the program from his mother's funeral that he kept in his wallet. He wasn't lying, she was real. He was real. He was a real person. I don't know what it was, but I believed him. We slowly began to grow together as people. I can't describe it. After a year of maintaining communication and learning about who he was, he enrolled in a local community college and began taking courses to earn credits before applying to university. I helped him study for his history class a lot. He's great at math and science, though. I never invited him over to my apartment, however. No matter how much I got to know him, I was still afraid of him. And he knew that. He knew that I couldn't trust him. Then one night we went out for coffee because he said he had an exam in his world civ class. When I got there, he said he forgot his book. We just talked for a bit, we laughed, and then he told me he wanted to cook for me. On a whim, I decided to invite him to my apartment. After picking up some things from the grocery store, he came over. I was so nervous that I was shaking. He noticed, he squeezed my hand, and then he made dinner. It was amazing. We talked, we laughed, we sat on the floor and watched a movie on the TV he tried to steal. We made jokes about it. And then he told me that he missed his mom. I gave him a hug. Then he left. I didn't know what I felt, but I did know that I couldn't give up on people anymore. Some people just get the short end of the stick. I figured maybe things would have a way of working themselves out. I miss my dad, too. 
Maybe my sympathy for him is why I didn't see the tornado coming. Six months later, everything spiraled. I cared about him. I cared for him. I did, I can't deny that. In January, right after the new year started, I got a phone call at 2.30 in the morning from him. He was in jail. He and two of his friends were arrested for public intoxication and were in possession of substances. He wanted me to bail him out. I'm a teacher living on a teacher's salary. I said no, I couldn't. This is when things fell apart. Before then, he and I had been incredibly close. We spent Christmas together. I didn't have enough money for a plane ticket home, so I stayed in the city. He came over, we cooked, and watched movies. Before Christmas, we spent Thanksgiving together. I helped him study. I helped him get his finances in order. He had no idea how to do taxes and how to do all of the adult stuff, as he said. But I noticed I started doing things I didn't normally do. He would come over in the middle of the night, visibly panicked, and ask if he could stay with me. I let him, no questions asked. I stopped asking questions because I wanted to believe that he was good and everything was fine. He began asking me whether I would lie and claim not to know him if others inquired about him. This scared me, but I assumed it was about work stuff. I wanted it to be his work stuff. He was released from jail about a week later. He didn't talk to me. I called his apartment. Nothing. I came home from work one day and a woman was waiting outside my door. She appeared messy. She was wearing a tank top and flip-flops in mid-January in the Northeast. It was cold. When I tried to key into my apartment, she started verbally attacking me. She told me to stay away from him. Like she owned him. She told me that she knew what I did to him. And that I would get what's coming. She left. I was scared out of my mind. Before calling the police, I decided to call his apartment one last time. He answered. I told him about the woman. He apologized, said that he was seeing her. He didn't intend for her to come over and interfere. But that led me to another question. How did she know where I live? And how many others had he told where I lived? He hesitated before answering, I remember that. He just said he was sorry. I immediately packed an overnight bag, grabbed my most valuable items, and went to stay in a hotel. I used my emergency credit card because I no longer felt safe, because of him. I came back to my apartment the next day. Everything was fine. He came over to apologize. I told him to get out. I started crying. When I'm angry, I cry. He tried to hug me, but I remember picking up a dismantled IKEA shelf to protect myself. I demanded to know what he was doing. He told me he was selling substances. He told me that he had to do it because he knew people that would hurt him. Lies. I guess. I don't know. I told him to get out, I never want to see him again and so on. He got angry and then threatened to come back with his friends. I was racked with guilt for trusting him. He apologized again, and said he was sorry. I was questioning everything about him. I pushed him out and locked the door. The teaching program I'm a part of rotates teachers in and out of schools across the country. Last year I put in a request to move across the country to be closer to home. Two weeks after this encounter with him, I found out that my request was accepted and I was set to leave in March. My apartment was broken into and vandalized in early February. At night, he would come and knock on my door. I would call the police but he would always leave before they got there. His guys started harassing me. Nothing was ever stolen, just broken. They broke a glass bottle my dad made for me when I was six. He knew how much that meant to me. It was shattered. The week before I left, I saw him outside my building. I called the police. He was walking over to me, and I remember having this fiery rage in me. It was this impassioned, red, angry heat that washed over me. I took my keys, which are on a lanyard, and I just started hitting him. I ended up cracking his eye socket. After he fell down, I started kicking him. I wanted him to die. I really did. Then I thought about what my dad would think. But then I realized. I'm not my dad. I will never be him. I'm different. This is different. People are different. Not all of them are good. But some of them are. I am good. I am a good person. When the police arrived and questioned him, they realized he was the one that was harassing me. He was wanted for a myriad of other charges. I never saw him again. Right now I'm sitting in my new apartment in a brand new city. It's warm. Rent is cheaper. I live in a neighborhood of old people. They're nice. They love that I teach kids. It makes them feel safe, I guess. Some days I leave my front door open and let in a breeze. I'm never afraid. The beach is literally a seven minute walk from my back door. I'm happy. So I'm putting this to rest. It's done. It's over. I'm tired. She had a man but wanted me. So I beat her cheeks and sent her back to the streets. My girlfriend of four years decided that she'd rather date some army guy she'd known for only a month. She dropped me to the curb for him. After some time had passed, I decided I would try to get back out there again and just have some fun. I figured online dating would be a good option. For the most part, it went alright. 
a few replies here and there, I had a few conversations with some girls who provided some decent enough conversations, but nothing that really made me want to go and meet them. Then I matched with Jessica. She was really funny and laid back, we shared interests, and she had a gorgeous smile. I was really excited to meet her. Usually, I never know when it's the right moment to ask a girl out. I'm sure it's cost me relationships before, as they might think I dragged out the talking phase too long. But it wasn't like that with Jessica, so I just bit the bullet and said we should meet up for a drink. She was completely upfront and told me that she's had some bad experiences meeting guys online before, and offered to meet up in a group scenario. This was honestly my worst nightmare. As someone who is an introvert, meeting her face to face, let alone a whole group of her friends, was daunting enough. But I knew that I really liked what I'd learned about her, so I psyched myself into it and went along. We ended up going to a local pub to play trivia. There were three or four of her friends there, and they were actually pretty fun people. The night went well and afterwards, she gave me a hug and a kiss on the cheek, telling me she really wants to meet up again, but one on one this time. I smiled and told her I'd call her and we can set it up. I called her the following night and suggested Saturday night for our date. She was a music teacher and was out of town that weekend with a music excursion. She apologized profusely but asked about doing a group date again. She told me that all of her friends really enjoyed having me around and that I should go to trivia again. I didn't really want to let the whole group dynamic become too regular, but I really liked her, and she seemed to be genuine so I went along. That night, I get to the pub and Jessica waves me over to the table they were at. I go over and think, at least I can grab a seat next to her. I arrived at the table and there was a guy there that wasn't there the week before. He extends his hand and introduces himself as Kyle. I'm a bit annoyed but shrug it off. About half an hour into the trivia rounds I look over and Jessica has her hand on this guy's leg. I'm completely taken aback by this but don't jump to any conclusions. I thought to myself, maybe he's a friend she's known for a long time. Boy was I wrong. The night goes on and it becomes very obvious that Kyle was her boyfriend. While I'm keeping cool on the surface, I'm fuming underneath. I drag myself to a pub on a Tuesday night twice, to spend time with people I didn't know and then she springs this on me. By this point, I have absolutely zero interest in still being there. I don't want to be rude though, so I stay until the end of trivia. I completely stop participating though. Trivia finishes and we're all hanging around outside, and they talk about going to a bar in the city for a few drinks. I politely said that I needed to get up early and went home. Over the next few days, Jessica kept sending me Facebook messages. She eventually realized that I was not interested in hanging out anymore, and one afternoon she called me asking what my deal was. I explained to her that she had a boyfriend. And she didn't understand why this was a problem. I explained to her that when I meet someone on a dating website, ideally it would be for dating purposes. She, somehow, didn't understand this concept and started ranting at me about how I'm a selfish jerk. I tried to explain that my actions were the opposite of selfish, but she was having none of it. She tells me that if I were to just put in a bit more effort, she would have slept with me regardless of her boyfriend. That was her biggest mistake. I used that information to form a devious plan. I decided that I was going to do whatever it took to sleep with her and expose her to Mr. Boyfriend. I went to two more trivia nights and could tell that the vibe between us had changed. So, I texted her and asked her to come see a movie with me. And she obliged. When we went to the movie, I tried my best to act like her boyfriend's situation didn't bother me and put on my A-game. Afterward, we went back to my apartment and got freaky for the remainder of the night. Little did she know, I had a camera set up in my bedroom to record the whole thing. I kicked her out in the morning and told her that I had to get ready for work, then I sent the video to all of her friends on Facebook and blocked her number. Her close friends began bombarding me with texts, claiming that they were going to beat me up, but nothing ever came of it. Surprisingly, her boyfriend responded to me and said that he thought I was one of her gay friends. Apparently, she had done this before and cheated on him many times using this method. Her boyfriend kicked her out of the house and left her on the street. I haven't heard from any of them in years, but I know I did the right thing. Confronted my wife about a disturbing secret she hid for the past 5 years. It changed our lives. It was 2.43 am when I woke up with a parched throat. I reached over to the nightstand for the water bottle but froze midway. My wife, Ella, lay beside me, her back facing me, her body shuddering in the semi-darkness. She was crying. But she was crying so quietly that it seemed like she didn't want to wake me up. I wasn't sure if she could tell if I was awake or not. It broke my heart to see her like that. We were college sweethearts. The way we ended up together was a bit messy. Fran, my ex-girlfriend from college, had dumped me, and in an attempt to make her jealous, I started dating Ella. Ella was everything Fran couldn't stand, and I gave Ella everything Fran had ever wanted. But what started as some stupid tactic to make my ex jealous turned into a lifelong commitment. Ella turned out to be the one. The more I got to know her, the more I fell in love with her intelligence, her kindness, and her beauty. She was, and still is, my soulmate. Things took a dramatic turn a few months ago when Fran moved back to our city and back into our friend group. One night, the girls decided to go out, splitting themselves into two cars. Ella was supposed to be in one car, Fran in another. But fate had other plans. Fran's car was hit by another vehicle. The news was horrific, Fran had a couple of broken bones, but my initial relief of Ella being in another car was short-lived. Ella was actually in Fran's car, on the passenger side, the side that took the worst hit. It was a gut-wrenching moment when I learned of this. I couldn't fathom the fear and pain she must have gone through. But Ella, being the fighter she is, breezed through physical rehab like it was nothing. Her relentless strength and spirit inspired me. It had always been one of the things I admired most about her. So to see her lying in bed bawling her eyes out was shocking to me. 
I had never seen her cry before. After the first night I noticed, they continued for days. She'd cry for hours, silently, stealthily. And then, in the morning, she'd put on a strong, happy face as if nothing had happened. Each time I stirred in bed, she'd grow quieter, ensuring I remained undisturbed. My mind was in a whirlwind. I loved her more than anything in the world, and seeing her in pain but not knowing why was unbearable. Despite all of our friends still focusing on Fran's injuries, I couldn't help but be more concerned about Ella. I had to know what was causing her such distress. One night, we were sitting in bed. We had just finished watching the movie Hachi, so our emotions were already stirred up a bit. I decided to say something. I mustered up the courage to confront her. Ella, I began softly, I know you've been crying at night. She tensed, her breath hitched, but she didn't respond. I held her, pulling her close and assuring her that she could tell me anything, and I would be there for her. And then it came out. The reason behind her silent tears. She told me that she had been crying for the past few weeks, but I had only noticed recently. When she had gone to her last checkup, she complained about having a constant headache in the back of her head. The doctor advised that she immediately went to the hospital to get it checked out, and so she did. Ella had brain cancer. She had been diagnosed shortly after the accident but chose to keep it a secret. She was scared to start chemotherapy because she was afraid of seeing her without hair. She didn't want to burden me or affect our relationship with her prognosis. She only had a few months to live. The revelation was a bombshell. I held her tighter as she let out her tears, no longer silent. The enormity of her situation was overwhelming, but it brought a level of understanding and closeness. Ella had been silently bearing her pain to protect me, to keep our relationship from the shadow of her impending mortality. But now that I know, we could face it together. No matter how tough the journey ahead would be, we resolved to face it hand in hand, supporting each other. Ella wasn't alone in this, and I made sure she knew it. Her strength and resilience made me fall in love with her all over again. It's been three years since that happened. Ella underwent an intense surgery in order to remove a majority of the tumor, and the chemotherapy got rid of it altogether. We now have a beautiful daughter and can't wait for what the future holds for us. If you have a personal struggle going on in your life, don't hesitate to tell someone. It might just save your life. My twin slept with my girlfriend and outed me to everyone. Luckily God had a plan for him. Sebastian and I have never been close. He would always put me down, belittle me, bully me with his friends at school, break my stuff, and so on. Growing up the only people I knew to rely on were my older sister Jane, my cousin Kai, and my best friend Isaac, who all knew what an awful person my brother was. When I was 17, I got my first girlfriend who I loved very much. We didn't have intimacy because she wanted to wait until her 18th birthday, but it turned out that she was having an affair with my brother behind my back for half the time we were together. She was only caught when it was revealed she was pregnant. I was crushed. She knew how much I hated my brother and she saw some of the awful things he did to me but she still went and did that. Cheating is bad enough, but to do it with him, of all people? Really? I punched him in the face. I broke his nose and made him lose a tooth, but according to my parents I was the one in the wrong. Now we had to help this girl who was carrying my brother's child and had to help support them. My brother then said he had no intention of being a father and told my girlfriend to get an abortion. She then ran out of town and I never saw her again. I don't know if she had the baby or aborted it. All I know was that she was gone, and my folks were still praising my brother as the golden child. I was still the black sheep and a failure, as usual. Another year passed, and me and my brother still despised each other, but I had started dating again. This new guy Daniel I had met at college caught my eye. He was deaf and I studied sign language out of boredom so we got talking and things just seemed to click. We dated, fell in love, and I brought him to my friend Isaac's party to introduce him to my friends. At this point, the only one who knew I was by was Isaac. But one day walking into a cinema holding my boyfriend's hand I bumped into my evil twin. He pointed, laughed, and said some homophobic remarks. I told him to go away and I went to see a movie with my arm around my boyfriend. When I got home after dropping my boyfriend off, I knew I'd be facing something as I walked through the front door. I saw both my parents on the sofa, my mother crying about how on earth she could have given birth to someone so disgusting. My father got up to yell at me and spout homophobic remarks and slurs. At this point, I saw my brother up the staircase with a grin on his face. He then came down and said he was uncomfortable with sharing a room with a slur. My folks kicked me out right there and then. With what little clothes and money I had, I went to Isaac's house and his family took me in. I stayed for six months, actually experiencing familial love and affection. Eventually, me, Daniel, and Isaac all got a two-bedroom flat together and all was good for the time being. In December of last year, me and my now husband Daniel got married. I had a brilliant job in graphic design, had my own house by the sea, and life had never been better. However, I got a call from my sister that my brother was in the hospital. I hadn't thought about him much over the nine-year period since I was kicked out but being reminded of his existence brought up a lot of painful memories for me. I was told by my sister that Sebastian wanted to see me and that it was urgent, so I went to the hospital he was in and met my sister outside the front entrance. I asked her what this was all about but she didn't tell me and said that I needed to ask my twin. So I arrived where my brother was. My parents were at his side and they actually looked happy to see me, as if what they did to me hadn't happened. Sebastian also looked really pleased to see me. It was safe to say something was off. Eventually, I asked what was going on and why I was even here. My brother told the family to leave us two alone. He looked so weak as before he used to intimidate me so much. He told me that he was dying from kidney failure and had been for the past few years but now he didn't have long left. I knew immediately where this was going. 
He then said he always regretted that we never got along. At that point, I knew exactly what he was going to ask. I didn't even let him finish. I told him no. He looked confused and asked what I was on about so I simply told him I wasn't going to donate my kidney to save him. He looked as if I had just pooed in his food. He then went on about how bad the situation was and that he really was sorry for all the things we did to each other growing up. We did to each other? I told him that I just wanted a brother growing up that cared and loved me and wouldn't try to break me every day for 18 years. He then called in our mom and dad and told them that I wasn't going to give up my kidney. They then started to spout off that I owed them for my existence and that I had a duty to look after family. Instead of defending myself, I flipped the question around. I asked them where was that duty when they kicked me out of the house. Where that duty was every time my brother gave me a black eye. Where was that duty was to look after their grandchild when Sebastian decided he didn't want to be a father. At this point, they weren't talking. I said that for all the things he had done from outing me to having an affair with my girlfriend and abandoning his child, this was the universe's way of finally giving back what he dished out. I then turned around and walked out of the room, having that be the last time I ever saw Sebastian again. I walked past my sister who gave me a look. I gave her a look back and she then gave me a look that said she understood. After leaving the hospital I felt as if a great weight had been taken off my shoulders. I went home and never looked back. Last week I got a call from my sister calling to inform me that Sebastian had died. I felt nothing. Screw that guy.